Why do people believe starships will go to Mars? Can we use molten salt batteries on the moon? What's the difference between the universe and the observable universe? And in Q&A Plus, what is the chance of hitting a stone during an interstellar voyage? All this and more in this question show. It's time for the question show. Your questions, my answers, as always, wherever you are across my channel. If a question pops in your brain, just write it down. I'll gather them up and I will answer them here. All right, let's get into the questions. Dean T, I'm really struggling to imagine starships landing on Mars. I just can't see it happening. Can you help me understand why people think it will happen? And I can't. I mean, it's it's not that complicated. Um, you have starship enter the atmosphere on Mars, and it uses the atmospheric lift and drag to slow its velocity down as much as it can, and then sort of use its lifting body shape of the spacecraft. And once it's run out of lift, and it's getting dangerously close to the ground, it flips over, and then fires its retro rockets and slows itself down and lands vertically. I mean, we've seen it do this flip operation coming back down from 20 kilometers of altitude. We know that it's been going on a suborbital trajectory passing back through the atmosphere and landing with pinpoint accuracy in a specific spot in the ocean. So, you know, is this theoretically feasibly possible? Yeah, yeah. Where Starship stands right now, super heavy works, it is able to return to the launch pad, it's grabbed by Mechazilla. Starship you know, we've had two of them now we've seen that have have burned through their engines and exploded. Okay, they need to fix that problem. But you know, we've seen previous ones earlier ones that were able to work successfully. So it doesn't like these sound like solvable problems. And so you can imagine, you know, maybe if you don't get to that fully reusable two stage rocket system today, you can imagine a super heavy lift rocket that is able to throw giant payloads towards Mars. Uh, that seems feasible to me. Landing on Mars, it's Mars is very dangerous to land on. And for the longest time, people lost a lot of spacecraft trying to land on Mars because the atmosphere is like too thick and too thin at the same time. And so there's you can't do a pure atmospheric descent the way you do on Earth or the way you would on Venus, you can't do a power descent the way you do on the moon, you have to do this kind of hybrid approach. And it's very sketchy and very dangerous. But now people have, you know, worked their way through it, you know, NASA doesn't fail, the Chinese landed on Mars on their first attempt. So you know, none of these sound like unsolvable problems to me. I mean, I think for me, um, the remaining issues with Starship as a as a heavy lift vehicle, as a way of sort of continuing on spaceflight into the future, the two main issues that remain are reusability. So in other words, if you want to just throw away your starships every time you launch them, that feels fine, right? You could do that. And that's the way the rocket industry has worked for the longest time. But to actually have starship re enter the Earth's atmosphere, survive re entry with its heat tiles, land and be captured by Mechazilla, be refurbished and launched again, that is going to be a lot more complicated. And I think we are many years away from that being the reality. The other thing is orbital refueling. Because it's such a heavy vehicle, uh, a lot of the big plans for Starship require being able to refuel in orbit. And this is not a thing that we know how to do yet. Uh, people have done very small experiments in orbital refueling, transferring, storing cryogenic propellants in space. But like at that scale, 20 starships flying up and docking and transferring propellant over and it remaining stable for long periods of time and then it firing up its thrusters and moving on to another planet like this has not been done before. So those are the big outstanding challenges. If they can work through that, then I think they can work through landing on other planets, I, you're going to see a lot of starships explode on the moon and on Mars like don't get me wrong, I would never get in a starship and go to Mars or the moon. No, thank you. Um, but but do I think they will eventually crack this or, or the Chinese version of Starship will crack this? Yeah, I think this is an engineering problem. And eventually, they will figure it out. Uh, you know, there could be some fundamental issues that will make it that it just never is going to work. It's never going to be safe. But then there's other ways around that. Like it's you don't you don't land on the Starship. You you take Starship into orbit around Mars, and then you get out of Starship and you get into a smaller, safer descent vehicle that takes you down to the surface of Mars. So you know, right now we're in the early stages. You're living the dream, but later on, reality will finally teach us what's possible. But I don't think it should 
boggle your imagination that this will be possible down the road. Michael Stanley, why do we sometimes hear the phrase observable universe versus just the universe? Because there are two different things. The universe is everything. The universe is all that is, I was to call second, say all that is, that was, and will ever be. That you could travel hundreds of billions, trillions of light years in any direction, and you would still be in the universe. There would be stars and galaxies and planets and galaxy clusters and gas and dust, and there'd just be more universe. And yet, at every point that you go in the universe, there is the observable universe. And that is the point at which this sort of sphere that is around you, which is the amount of light that if it had been traveling since the very beginning of the universe could have reached your eyes. And the universe has existed for 13.8 billion years. And so light has been traveling for 13.8 billion years. And so in all directions, you're seeing the light that has been on that journey for 13.8 billion years. Now, the places that emitted that light have since been expanding away from each other. And in fact, they're now 46 billion light years away from you and not 13.8 billion light years away from you. But that is the observable universe. And every one of us has our own separate observable universe that you can go anywhere uh, in the universe. And now you see a brand new observable universe. You and I are seeing different observable universes because we are separated by space. It's time to shout out all the new $5 patrons and above. Morgan Johansson, Amelie, Azarada, James Holloman, Franz Fink, Hans Schultz, David Mebus, Gian Goforth, Daniel Weishart, and Mantis Duakis. Join the club at patreon.com slash universe today. Dixie Q, Fraser, when do you think we'll be able to see into the Oort cloud? Uh, probably never. Um, the Oort cloud is vast. It is like closing in on half the distance from here to the nearest star. And the objects are going to be a kilometer across, maybe a couple of kilometers, some are going to be larger than that, and they're very far apart. So we have a hard time detecting an object that is that small at the distance of Jupiter, not to mention finding objects that are that small, 10s of 1000s of astronomical units away from Earth. It's just so far. And yet comets, which come from the Oort cloud do this very handy thing of falling into the inner solar system and coming past the sun. And so we get a chance to see them, which is amazing. So um, why go searching for the Oort cloud, the Oort cloud will come to us. Puff Crusader 696. I went to the Corning Museum of Glass the other day and saw the failed mirror for the Hale telescope It was huge. My question is how big can a glass mirror physically get? What are the limitations? I don't know what the exact limitations are, what is the largest possible telescope mirror, but the largest possible or the largest telescope mirror that anyone sort of tried to explore and began building was called the overwhelmingly large telescope. And this was going to be a next generation ground based telescope that would come after the extremely large telescope. So right now you've got the very large telescope, which is in Chile, and it consists of four separate eight meter telescopes that are able to network themselves with some other smaller telescopes as well. And then the European extremely large telescope, which is under construction now should be complete by 2027 is a 39 meter telescope. And it's made up of a whole bunch of segments that are all connected together. And the overwhelmingly large telescope was going to be a 100 meter telescope, and it would it would have to be segments as well, sort of together in this giant hexagonal pattern that would then form this spherical mirror. And in the end, the project didn't move forward because it was decided that it was just, you know, there wasn't enough budget to build it. But it was widely considered to be the largest feasible possible telescope that you could build on Earth under the kind of gravity that we have. Now, if you go to space, then there's no limit, you could build a space telescope that is hundreds of kilometers across, you could build a telescope on the moon that could then be 600 meters across, right? Because it's one sixth gravity, you can make six times as big. So uh, yeah, the future is space telescopes. But Earth based telescopes are great too. Klondike 69 none could molten salt be used as a power storage for moon landers to survive the lunar night cycle. It's being used more and more in terrestrial power projects. So I don't know about molten salt, but I do know about superheated sand and the regolith on the moon. It's very similar to the sand that we have on Earth, as you can imagine, heating it up. 
So would that be possible? Yeah, totally could be possible. It's just like more engineering, more complexity, more things to work on. And so nobody has, has done this yet. It's more efficient to let your lander die than to try and build the additional expense of a system that could keep it alive. Andrea Lencione, what classic era science fiction author do you think came the closest to predicting where we are today with science and technology? I can't think of a science fiction author like a like Ray Bradbury, Isaac Asimov, um, Heinlein kind of authors who did a good job of predicting where we are today. The world is very different from I think what they were expecting, you know, more computery, less flying carsy. And so I think about people like Neil Stevenson, who is a science fiction author has made some really interesting predictions about the future of, of the internet, um, you know, the metaverse, um, that worked out pretty well. Um, Charles Strauss with his accelerando book was pretty good. But yeah, I can't, man, it's like when we think about science fiction, they they got the, the you know, they thought there would be these large sweeping things about the future about about transportation about um, health. And none of those things came to pass. But instead, what we have is computers, we have cell phones, we have smartphones, and now we're about to have AI. And that is going to radically change the world, the world is going to be fucking weird. You know, in the next couple of years, um, because of artificial intelligence in a way that we're not sort of emotionally prepared. And I don't think anybody has done a good job of predicting that there was this great idea that came out in um, sort of science fiction circles a couple of years ago, about the singularity, right? This idea that, you know, maybe Verne Vin Verne Vinge was the one who kind of nailed it, which is that we can't know that that computers are going to design computers and those computers are going to design computers and things are going to accelerate and get weirder. And the world is going to seem incomprehensible and just get faster and faster and faster. Like unless we put the brakes on this, the world is going to get weird. And you already probably feel unmoored by the things that are starting to happen with technology. And we're still at baby steps for where this is about to go. So I think that's where we're going to get is the singularity beyond which we can't really predict. It is just like a black hole, like a gravitational singularity. How do you know what comes after maximum weirdness, infinite weirdness? We can't know. So yeah, I would say if I had to pick one science fiction author who made the most chilling, compelling prediction, it would be uh, Vervingi's uh, idea of the singularity. Did you know that you can watch the same video with no ads and get a bonus question over on Patreon completely for free? We call it Q&A Plus. And this week's bonus question, what's the chance of hitting a stone during an interstellar voyage? And I'll put a link in the show notes. All right, those are all the questions that we had this week. Thank you everyone who asked your questions in the YouTube comments, everybody who joined us for the live show. We're still on our live stream hiatus, but we are back in about two weeks. Uh, it's going to be the first Monday after Labor Day. So I was at the seventh, eighth. Anyway, uh, so I'll, I'll put a an event here on the channel shortly, and you'll be able to sign up for that to come back for the live show. Now, I'm going to let you know a way that you can get your question answered guaranteed. But First, I'd like to congratulate Scott Manley on uh, being able to go full time being a content creator, YouTuber, and uh, quitting his day job, which is amazing. Like, can you believe that Scott Manley gets all this done and was also working full time as a programmer? And now he has all of that time. And that means he'll be able to say yes to all the collaborations that I have planned for him. So congrats, Scott. Uh, welcome to the club. Now, I'm going to thank our patrons and then talk about how you can get your question answered guaranteed. A special thanks to Abe Kingston, Andrew Gross, Bear Lake Roofing, Brian Body, Caradorn, Chuck Hawkins, Commander Baylock, Cy Nielsen, David Gilton, and David Matz, Evan Pro, Hudson Moore, James Clark, Jeremy Mattern, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Marcel Simmons, Michael Purcell, Monzo, Nick Borges, Nick Solari, Paul Robach, Rank Kaidu, Richard Williams, Sean Sargent, Stephen Father Menley, Vlad Jiplin, and Wolfgang Klotz, who support us at the Master of the Universe level. And all our patrons, all your support means the universe to us. 
So I just put out the call on Patreon for all of the patrons to send in your questions for the patrons question show for August. I know patron, patron, patron. But uh, this is a way that all of the patrons who have a burning question can ask me and I will uh, answer the question with my producer, Anton. Uh, so far, the shows are running between four and five hours long. We get to all of the questions that people submit. And they're great because I get to do a bunch of research beforehand. I get to do the math if the question requires math. And it's a very advanced audience who know a lot about space. And so they're asking really interesting edge case questions that you have not heard before. Um, so you can go right now if you want, become a patron. And of course, we're offering our 57% off deal on your first month of joining our Patreon. And not only can you now access the entire back catalog of all of the patron only content, you get to ask your question during the patrons question show. Uh, but you can do a personal private conversation interview with me, as well as at higher levels, we'll shout out your name and put it in the various videos. So if that's interesting to you, the special deal runs until August 25th, just go to patreon.com slash universe today, you'll see the link. So you can sign up for our uh, special deal and then get all those additional member benefits. All right. Again, congrats, Scott. Uh, and we'll see you next time.